Today with us, we have Dominica de Grandis. She's the author of Making Work Visible, a book many of you, if not all of you, are probably very familiar with. She's the principal flow advisor at Castop and an expert in Kanban flow within the IT industry today. We are very fortunate to have her sharing with us some of her work for Parts Unlimited. And uh, with that, Dominica, I'll pass it to you. All right, thank you, Alex. I'm just gonna share out my uh, share out my screen so we can get this going. And you'll have to let me know uh, after I switch to presentation mode what you see. Okay. Do I need to swap my displays or tell me what you see? No, this is perfect. We've got your slides up full screen and then we've got a small video of you on the side to accompany it. All right, okay. So this session uh, comes in response to ITT teams at Parts Unlimited asking for, you know, how can they find time to complete work? How can they get important work done when, when they uh, are just totally overloaded, right? When the organization is in chaos, in chaotic mode. And so uh, just a little bit more background about me. I'm actually a huge fan of using visual cues to inspire change, to enable these necessary conversations you know, for change that allow organizations to go through a transformation or to continuously improve. And as principal flow advisor at Testtop, what I spend a lot of time doing is helping organizations design experiments in order to improve their flow, to optimize their throughput and their speed throughout their end-to-end -end value stream. So I'm a bit obsessed with metrics because experimentation, you know, by its very nature with the scientific method requires the capturing of data so we can see how things are going. Are we moving in the right direction or not? Uh, what's the point here? Well, the point is that people are drowning in work and demand is greater than our capacity to meet that demand. Rarely, do I use the word always, uh, except when it comes to requests on people's time, on my time, because the requests always exceed my capacity to meet that demand. As I'm doing this workshop, you know, I have two blog requests that are sitting idle. Uh, I've got another workshop that two actually that I'm doing next week that I should be preparing for, and I'm reading three books right now. And all of this needs to be done in the next 10 days or so. Uh, but I'm not alone in this regard. Um, so that's what, so the topics here, what we're gonna cover has to do with finding time to address important work, getting important daily work done, work that I tend to um, call revenue protection work. You know, there's this nice balance of revenue generation work, the features that business people want to prioritize and complete and that work tends to get prioritized over work that helps protect the revenue and so just to de define revenue protection here because from now on I'm probably going to refer to it as daily improvements but this includes technical debt refactoring the code base new ways of working you know keeping the lights on uh, infrastructure improvements, mo you know, setting up monitoring and improving monitoring, as well as cross-training other people, um, doing vendor package upgrades. Really, it's an investment to pay down potential future issues and risks. It's this time that we make to do improvements. Uh, improvement of daily work is actually my favorite ideal from the Unicorn Project, which I, I put a little there's the five ideals in the, the corner there. So number three there is really what we're focusing on today. Um, improvement for daily work requires this investment in improvements. You know, and if we don't have that investment, I see that as a clear signal of decline in the health of the organization. So we're gonna touch on that a bit. And because I'm a big fan of making work visible, I wanna show you some ways to bring visibility um, to these improvements, including tech debt and non-functional changes. 
and then I'll leave you with an exercise for how you can enable some work in progress limits in order to make daily improvements. So that's what's on the agenda today. Um, when I ask folks, why do you take on more work than you have capacity to do? These are some of the common answers. Conflicting priorities is almost always at the top of this list, but so is misjudged effort because I just didn't realize how long something was gonna take because things always take longer than we think they will for a variety of reasons. Uh, we often get back, well, I'm a team player, you know, I'm gonna pull one on for the team. Probably the biggest one that comes up is the boss. There, there's some other ones too, but here's an example. In my workshops, I pull the audience, the attendees, you know, ask them this question, why do you take on more work than you have capacity to do? And this is not an unusual response where we see the boss and we see that, um, you know, people are overwhelmed. Um, I mentioned competing priorities, conflicting priorities. I'm just gonna highlight those there because they're all, they're all over the place. We've got competing priorities and all high priorities, unclear prioritization, um, priorities change, and we have and we have other, um, sorry, just lost my track. And, and there's other indicators of time thieves in here too uh, for, that have to do with unknown dependencies, unplanned work, and neglected work. So it all sort of makes it clear what prevents people from getting work done, that this is related to the five thieves of time which if we could see and measure the impact of could help us improve our performance. So let me introduce them to you real quick unless it, if you're not familiar with them and that's unplanned work. This is the, you know, I can't log in to the test environment. Uh, I can't get the NFS mounts, can't find them, can't get the build to compile. This is the foundation of interruptions. In blue there, we have conflicting priorities. Um, this is, you know, what's the highest priority right now? Well, maybe Project Phoenix may be the highest priority, but what within Project Phoenix is the highest priority? You know, how do people really know what they should be working on right now? And then unknown dependencies. This is the, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you know, our, our data space schema changed uh, or a DNS issue. Um, when it comes to dependencies, I mean, how many people were required for Maxine to build out the Phoenix environment for builds? Uh, quite a lot, right? And then there's thief neglected work. This is usually important work, uh, but it doesn't get prioritized, right? Like it's like that security patch that's still not done. It's the database redo that's needed to avoid a database meltdown that occurs when a database migration takes five hours during a release instead of 15 or five minutes. Um, and then the ringleader of all the thieves, too much work in progress. And the reason that too much whip is the ringleader is because in one way or the other, all the other thieves uh, encourage the taking on, the saying yes of too much work. If we're unclear on what the priority is, then we tend to say, yeah, I'll do that. And it just increases our work in progress. When we have unplanned work that interrupts us, we take on too much work in progress. And so if we can expose these thieves, you know, just acknowledge their existence, make them visible, then we can begin to chase them away a bit and, and take back our day. So when demand is greater than capacity, uh, it's just really hard to get anything done. We get stuck. It's like, it's like having a traumatic event and we're just unable to move in the right direction because we're so overwhelmed. And so surveying Parts Unlimited, one of the top replies as to why work isn't completed is because there's just simply too much work to do. People are overloaded, they're drowning in work, largely due to unplanned work and 
conflicting priorities. So Maxine's dev environment took, I don't know how many days to get, but 45 different people had a part to play in that. So that's thief unknown dependencies at your service. And Maxine's boss, Randy, you know, couldn't approve Maxine's dev environment request on planned work until the end of the day because he had other higher priorities, right? Team A's priority isn't team B's priority. And likewise, Brent's name shows up all over the place on many critical action items. Uh, it seems like everybody's got him on speed dial. He's constantly interrupted with unplanned work. So it's not surprising that Brent has no capacity to work on features because he's fixing all these urgent defects. He's trying to stabilize the code base. He's, re he's having to respond to outages most of the time. You know, when the oil in the vehicle isn't changed regularly, disaster is inevitable. Um, although even if we do set WIP limits, what's the impact of an overloaded calendar. Like if you have a calendar that looks like, I, I call it three kinds of calendars, the 30 minute jam, the all day cram, and the triple booked wham. So if you have a calendar that looks like this, like when do you have time to have a think about how to improve your day? Um, so the common theme throughout these, all, these calendars is the amount of context switching from interruptions due to unplanned work and conflicting priorities and dependencies. So if, you're, if your killer does look like this, you're likely impacted from time thieves and it's hard to get anything done. Um, the, um, and so you have this situation going on where there's all kinds of stuff in the backlog that you're trying to do, but not much is getting done. You're spinning your wheels, uh, not much happening. This is a blow up of the triple book wham calendar. Uh, what are you going to do if you're triple booked? Right? I mean, you cannot be in three places at one time. So either you don't show up, you do one of these carry on without me, or, or you cancel the meeting. And that all has a cost in rework. So uh, if the decision maker isn't at the meeting, <laughs> but decisions get made anyway. Like for example, that LARB, you know, the ops meeting where Maxine and Adam, they present their proposal to move Data Hub into a new environment. Um, and they, they wanna run things on containers. They wanna have automated code builds, tests and deployments. And it gets shot down. Like they're told to bring it back up in six months. Um, there's a cost to that, the cost of delay. Because if you spend a lot of time putting work together, that person just you know spent hours preparing, creating uh, information for that meeting. The meeting gets canceled. They move on to other work, right? And if they have to return six months later, or even six weeks later, or heck, six hours later, there is a cost to that because knowledge work is perishable. Like the more time between doing the work and getting feedback or decisions needed in order to complete the work, the more we forget things, the longer it takes to retrieve that information. And, and it's much harder to get back up to speed on that. So you gotta ask like, what's the cost of delay to your business? Um, you know, and how many of you have this going on? For the, for the ops meeting, um, it turns out that, you know, Kurt decides to, they're going to support it themselves, right, with the help of a few others. But then later on, what happens, Chris finds out about it because Chris wasn't at the meeting, right? He was doing something else. And so he was quite unhappy about it. You know, what the heck have you got me into? Uh, eventually, fortunately, he agrees to, to support it. Um, but uh, a triple booked wham meeting uh is is a cost that i think we don't consider and and we should uh, so conflicting priorities um, important uh, but neglected work like daily improvements calls for revisiting prioritization policies so you can have a lot of high priorities but you can only have one top priority and just like Proper maintenance keeps our cars in shape. 
uh, maintenance for environments and databases and ways of working like we need to we need time to do that too important daily improvements can fall victim to thief neglected work right if they're, especially if they're overpowered with the promise of some new feature that's going to generate revenue and this work then you know morphs into uh, urgent work uh, which morphs into an emergency sometimes, like the database meltdown during the Phoenix project. Um, so keep in mind that a decision to do one thing is actually a decision to delay something else. That's sort of the point of this slide here. And to understand that unhealthy systems and infrastructure, they signal a decline um, from technical debt in the future, the more debt, the longer it takes to deliver something, even the smallest change. So consider, you know, what is your prioritization strategy for company health in order to keep things running smoothly? And one way to start that conversation is to bring visibility to the conflicting priorities. Um, here's just a simple Kanban that's showing that We've got unplanned work, there's project work, there's maintenance work, there's miscellaneous work that's going on, and they're all conflicting with each other. And that's what the shade of blue uh, area is trying to show that because we can only do so much at one time, there's work that gets put on hold. It falls to the bottom there of that chart. Um, so I found it to be quite powerful to bring visibility to conflicting parties because then you can start to show the wait times. How long do things actually take from dependencies and specialization because we have to wait on Brent for something. Uh, so there's another metric chart that I think could help you out really well also. And that's an aging report. So an aging report it's simple to do. Whatever your ticketing system is, just query it and say, show me all the work in progress that hasn't moved or hasn't been touched in X number of days. Maybe start with 30 days. This example shows 10 days, but that's usually way too short. Sometimes we need to bump that up to 60 days or 90 days or 120 days. And we're showing here not only the duration, the number of days that work has been sitting idle, but we're also showing we're also showing the average time that that kind of work uh, is completed, and we're also showing how many days longer than average that work in the pink there, because that can be a leading indicator. Uh, we can show that we're at risk there if we don't get some of that work done. Um, I'm showing thief neglected work and thief unplanned work on the same page here because they're sort of like cousins. If work continues to be neglected and second string and doesn't get the love or the budget or the attention it needs, it eventually turns into some emergency. It eventually turns into some type of unplanned work. Um, so got to change the oil in the car every so often. So here's uh, how to get your organization out of the debt mess uh, in order to make time for daily improvements. <coughs> um, so I know in the past, uh, Parts Unlimited has outsourced most of its IT. Uh, when, when that happens, outsourcing IT puts IT as a cost center, makes IT a cost center. And organizations who focus primarily on costs it you know there's a lot of data out there that shows it just simply increases costs but when you invest in people and invest in teams that's a true signal of momentum uh, and so we have a couple of examples to um, about that and the first is with Microsoft so this is just a snippet of Bill Gates's email uh, it's back in 2002. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. So he sent this email out to, the, to everybody, to the company, in order to reset the course that they were taking for security. 
basically. Um, he set up this trustworthy uh, computing initiative and is basically saying it is our highest priority for all the work we're doing. Like we have to lead the industry in this. And so they stopped working on features. Like they had a freeze on features basically until they could get their security uh, up and running. Um, it was already an important part uh, he's saying it's going to be an integral and indispensable part of everything that we do. And it sort of gave Microsoft this North Star of first focusing on risk and then focusing on data and daily improvements. And, and he uh, recognized that turning up those dials meant that he had to turn the feature dial down to zero. So, um, and it, it worked well for them, right? This example is Twitter platform. So initially it had been built on Ruby uh, and it made it difficult for search. So they had to switch to Java server. And when they did that, it led to like a threefold decrease in search latency. So pretty impressive decrease in search latency. I have a link down at the bottom there for you to check out. Um, but in order, you know, sometimes in order to run faster, you have to stop and tie your shoelaces, right? Uh, here's an example from Instagram. So they had this, you know, they nearly crashed their servers because it was, uh, they just had so much technical debt. <clears throat> um, a, lot of, a lot of things just on one server in LA. And so they took a big pivot and in three days changed their hosting to EC2 database. Uh, so they paid down their debt by switching to a Java server. Um, huge decrease in latency. Uh, they might, you know, co-founder Mike Krieger compared it to uh, open heart surgery and talks about how he now works preemptively to address te technical debt before it leads to catastrophe because it certainly will. So when we're talking about daily improvement, here's a list again of all the things I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, what makes up what people are doing with technical debt. Really, it's an investment to pay down the, the future issues. And number three there, our favorite, you take time to do improvements of daily work. So how do we do that? One way is to enable work in progress limits, right, for daily improvements. I mean, if people are going to do the work of their life, right, we have to enable a way for them to do that during normal business hours. Uh, if, if the only time you can get your most important work done is at midnight or Sunday afternoon, that's usually not sustainable for very long and people start updating their resumes. I mean, how many people have left Parts Unlimited at this point in time? So attrition is costly and we wanna keep our good people uh, on board. So this is a, a story of, I was working, I was coaching an organization and their bottleneck was invalidate. So I was trying to bring visibility to that. And the number there is accurate. They had 98 things in their validate state. <clears throat> um, and so we wanted to try and bring that number down. Um, and so they were asking, well, well, you know, how do we do this? I said, well, you, you know, you've got to reduce this, this web. And they said, well, what should that number be? And my response to that, because there's many ways that you can set work in progress limits, but my favorite is really, it doesn't really matter as long as it's less than 98. <laughs> so, you know, try dropping it down to 90 and then 80 and keep dropping it until you see a smooth flow of work flowing across your value stream. But if you've got 98 things in there, it's going to increase your work in progress. And we all know that the more work in progress there is, the longer things take. Um, so main point here is reduce WIP. And a good way to do that is to experiment. <clears throat> um, I also want to say that it's not that people aren't talented. It's just that they're constantly interrupted, 
right? So leadership really has to support a strategy that allows people to focus for a good 90 to 120 minutes at a time, several times a week without any, any interruptions. And that means making sure that people's calendars have spots for that uh, improvement of daily work, right? Actually on your calendar. Yes, have a work in progress limit for it, but also insert time on your calendar, like do not disturb hours so that teams have time um, to do their work. That kind of approach helps. I mean, we, when the mind is calm and relaxed is when we are the most creative and we can do our best work. But if we're dashing around from meeting to meeting to meeting and we've got boards that look like this with a hundred things on them, it's hard to be relaxed, right? So remember, true creativity flows from a state of relaxation and openness, you know, not from being all stressed out. And I just remember how stressed out Maxine was trying to get that environment up and running. And she spends like five hours solid one day trying to do that and has no success. Um, I would suggest creating a work item type for, yeah, I have, it's called debt here, but next time I make a picture like this, I want to call it daily improvement have a work item type, uh, for example, in green there called daily improvement. And then you can start to measure, when you categorize your work like this, you can start to see the buckets of types of work that, are, that get done. And it, it's an inside view into the real prioritization of the organization. So depending on the context, your organization, they may want to say, you know, we just need to focus on features right now. Like we've got this Phoenix release coming up. And so we're just full blown doing all features right now. But at some point, you know, during the release, when you have a lot of issues that come up, you need to allocate work for defects and improvement and risk. So uh, looking at this view of it starts to help you have a strategic conversation on what the allocation should be for our different types of work. And if you have meltdowns and you're Brent and you spend a lot of time dealing with outages, then by, if, if you're tracking that kind of work, it's going to show up, you know, these, those defects are going to show up on a chart like this. And you can see that, well, actually we're unable to allocate all of our capacity to features because we have so many issues that we need to deal with. Um, here's another way. So, so this chart, this graph is for work that was completed. But if you move back in time a bit, this Kanban, this chart is showing actual work in progress as a way to set work in progress limits that are on the left hand side there. So the width limits are we can do five features at any one time. It's just an example. And we can have three debts going on at any one time. And when you see that only blue and orange is getting delivered, see on the right where it says value delivered, that's like done, done. Uh, if, if green never gets to done, <laughs> the teams are starting to do improvements, but they never finish them then that's why this chart <coughs> is gonna show zero, right? If we're able to get those three things completed, then the chart before will show that. Um, so the bottom line, if you can categorize your work items either through tagging or, or flagging or just using fields and your tools, then you can visualize them in progress and hopefully set whip limits to allocate capacity for that. Uh, this example is showing work type distribution using horizontal swim lanes and, uh, and having whip limits associated with work item types is a very clever way to ensure that you're going to have capacity to work on depth. Um, I think this is one of the most important things that your business teams and your IT teams, especially leadership, need to understand that if there's a promise of being able to have time to do daily improvements, but then the only thing that gets 
prioritized to actually complete is feature work, then that's a huge problem. That's a huge red flag. Uh, here's another example. There's a million things, maybe not a million. There's hundreds of items in incoming in the backlog. And uh, the top three is a way that they've been prioritized, right? Let's not worry about rank stacking the entire backlog. Let's just focus on knowing how long it takes us to finish things. What are the next three things that we need to do? And then the whip limit there is eight. But what that's saying is that it's really seven plus one green. And if you look at the legend, we've got blue is revenue generation. Those are the features. Green is revenue protection, which is our daily improvements in our technical debt. And yellow is unplanned work. Notice there's no yellow in the backlog, right? <laughs> but look at all the yellow in the done column. So this work in progress SWIP limit policy is saying we can have eight things in progress at any one time, but one of them gets to be a daily improvement. Right? If you can get buy-in for that kind of policy, then you're on your way to you know, getting approval, making time to always have a daily, uh, daily improvement going on at any one time. And so here's the exercise for you. Uh, take a screenshot, um, but I'm sure we'll get you this deck. Is that right, Alex? We will get everybody yes okay thank you absolutely all right so the the purpose of this exercise is to bring visibility to the daily improvements that you know need to get done like fixed debt you know and and to provoke these necessary conversations on prioritization and what is our strategy here it's also to establish a practice of tracking and measuring our daily improvements, right? So we can improve those decisions on the desired ratio. What is the ratio that we need between features and daily improvements? You know, I'm just gonna start calling daily improvements DI. I'm gonna start a new, new term here, it's DI, and it stands for daily improvements, daily uh, improvement work item types. So with your team, just spend, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, depends on the size of your team, and all you need is a view of your current workflow. You know, is it, maybe it's in a tool, maybe you have a physical board, but you have access to the work that's flowing across your value stream. And the instructions here are have a talk about what fields are available in your tool set for tracking work. For example, if you're using JIRA, do you have issue types that can be called daily improvements? <laughs> Uh, or are you going to need to use labels to do that? Um, what about Azure DevOps? Do you have the, um, they call it WIT, work issue type. You know, maybe there's a work issue type there that you can customize to be daily improvements. Or in your service now, they have these uh, group types that you can use. So have a look at your tool set and see where can you find a way to categorize daily improvements in your workflow. Because if you can do that, then you can make it visible and you can start to measure it. You can see how much of it's being done and how long it's taking. So uh, number two there, um, continue the conversation on how you're gonna categorize that work. Uh, maybe you need to set up conditions for your work types so that you can filter on your DI, your daily improvement work. Uh, conditions being, well, you know, we have an issue type of story in JIRA um, and, and we have to set a condition that says if, uh, if whatever, if one of these fields is set to debt or set to enhancement or set to improvement, then we're going to consider that our DI work, our daily improvement work. Experiments are, um, I have found, an excellent approach to trying to make changes in an organization because I've never seen 25 managers get together and agree on any one thing. It's usually sort of like that one director or manager 
who sort of gets it, they understand it. I call it the coalition of the willing. Find that one person, hopefully on the business side, that sort of understands how much pain you're in and they're in and they're willing to sponsor an experiment, just a short one in order to improve their situation. Sometimes going to the leader who has the most chaos going on or who is losing people, who feels like they have nothing to lose, can be a way to get buy-in to do this. But all you really need is the goal. You know, what's your hypothesis? What are the activities? What are the teams going to try? And how are you going to measure it? What are the metrics that you're going to use? And here's three experiment ideas for you, right? Uh, if things move fast, do things, do, does speed improve if the, the teams have less work in progress that they're multitasking, trying to multitask around? Second one has to do with cross-functional teams. If you think that, you know, it's so common for leaders to just want to hire more developers. Like, we need more developers. But then when you look at the workflow, it turns out that, well, some of those developers are sitting idle because they're waiting on wireframes. <laughs> and so maybe adding a designer or an analyst on the business side to the team could improve your flow time. Would that be an interesting experiment to try? Uh, the third one is, um, you know, do, if we allocate WIP for DI work, that should say DI there for daily improvements, does that increase team happiness? So for the first one, um, just take a quick screenshot of this, it's just, there's just two measures that you're going to track. I mean, the, the activities involved in this would really be just setting it up so that you can capture the flow load. Flow load is a measure of the current work in progress that the team has. And you're just looking at the trends. Is it going up? Is it going down? The, the vertical axis on the left there is the number of work items that the team has in play. So not the stuff in the backlog, not the stuff that's done done, but the stuff, the work that's in play. It's, it's partially completed work. You've, you've started it, but you haven't finished it yet. So find a way to track that and then get the flow time of it. The flow time is about when, when we started on something to when it was completed and not just at the team level, but you know, hopefully across uh, end to end across your value stream. And the flow time is going to include all the wait time. There's a lot of conversations on estimation right now and spending a lot of time estimating how long things will take. But I would argue that most of that flow time is where work sits in a wait state. And we're waiting and waiting, we're waiting on Brent, we're waiting on other specialization um, folks, we're waiting on the database uh, restore. <laughs> There's so much weight that's in the system that in the big picture of things, we should, if we're gonna estimate anything, we should estimate how long things wait. Okay, that was my rant. Uh, next up, do delays decrease with cross-functional teams? You know, if we brought in a designer or business analyst to the team, would that make things go faster? This is all about trying to reduce dependencies on external teams because it's it's just it's in especially in large organizations, it's impractical for lots of people working on lots of different projects to be aware of every decision that impacts them. I worked at an organization once, very large retail, and they had like 200 agile teams. Uh, and they had this concept of an away story. An away story was a story where they had to go away to a different agile team to get the information or the skill set that they needed in order to continue their work. And there were so many away stories that um, it just, there's so many dependencies. It was ridiculous. There's unable to complete much without having to go away. You know, at the portfolio level, uh, there's all these initiatives and we've just highlighted one in orange there, sort of at the top. And so if you take one 
initiative and you break it out it, in, in that view, it sort of looks like things are fairly spelt out, you know, it gets broken down into different programs and that work gets broken down and spread out across different teams and the organization. But the reality is that we lose the transparency between the initiative at the top and all the work that's required down at the team level. And, and the hardest thing we do is communicate uh, across teams. So there's the uh, unknown dependencies there in orange, um, just bringing attention to uh, wherever you're at now. Uh, I should have a legend on this. Sorry, Alex, I'll have it in the next version. The, the green arrow is representing uh, people within the team who are actually starting and ending work together. And the first row is showing that design, that uh, role is completely out external to this team. And the last horizontal role there is showing that they've brought design into the team. So there's, at, at least they're on the same team now. They're still not starting everything at the same time, but they have, they're, they're able to, you know, baby steps. Let's, let's bring people who we think are our roles that we think are our bottleneck and fold them into our group, uh, our, our product team so that we at least have, can reduce the amount of time spent working in different, trying to communicate across different tools, different systems, whatnot. I wanna give you this dependency matrix to help you with that. So, um, how this works is the role, I, so this is in my book, Making Work Visible at the, I have two versions of it. One is the teams themselves, and there's different teams like marketing, sales, you know, sales ops, development, tests, whatever. And the other one is at the component level. But the more I thought about it, I think that doing a dependency matrix using rules could be a useful exercise. And you're just listing, uh, on the left-hand side, you're listing roles that are needed by other people. And then on the uh, uh, horizontal um, axis above, it's the same groups of people, but these are the people who need stuff from you to do their job. So for example, what we're trying to do here is surface orange. Orange is the risk. Orange is all the dependencies, right? We're adding an orange dot for each um, communication or handoff, whatever, the people above who need stuff, um, whatever that is, we're adding a dot. And we're just trying this out for, in this example, like three weeks. What has your dependencies looked like in the last three weeks? And we're trying to surface orange because that's showing the risk, it's showing all the dependencies. So you can see that, look at the change control horizontal line. Like this got four orange dots. So maybe that's a signal to go look at your change control process. And then you could create a DI, a daily improvement work item type in your system and get it prioritized to maybe automate your change advisory board process. Um, there's um, another one is like, look at the value stream architect, the vertical. It's like the one, two, three, it's like the fifth column in that stands for value stream architect, which is a new role that we're seeing emerging right now as a lot of organizations are moving from project to product we're seeing the need of a value stream architect to help um, teams make their bottlenecks visible and to um, you know sort of train um, team members who are who, who have been in a project mode and moving now to a product centric way of working anyway you know, they've got three dependencies. They got one on InfoSec, security, the enterprise architect, and change control. So you could add whatever you call your roles in your organization, just swap them out or add them to this list and see. Uh, be interested to hear how this works for you on these dependencies. Be interesting to see how many, what role you decide to use for Brent and how many orange dots he has. Uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of measuring wait time, and there's a name for that metric. It's called flow efficiency. And this is the ratio, the uh, equation is there. 
Uh, it's the ratio of work time versus wait time. So work divided by weight plus work times 100%. That's your flow efficiency. How much of your speed metrics, how long do things take because uh, that work is sitting in a weight state? This metric will reveal that information. Although I admit it, it's a little bit more advanced because you need a workflow system that actually has weight states in it so you could see where the handoffs are between different teams and how long things sat waiting for that third party vendor. Uh, so these are some metric, I'm not, don't have time to go into all of them, but I just wanted to show you, these are the metrics that I think are important um, for anybody going through a DevOps transformation to use. Uh, and I just wanted to bring up this point about flow safety there. I mean, what we measure impacts people because people value what's measured. So I briefly, I talked about flow distribution at the top left, being able to see for work that was completed, what was that distribution of the different work item types. And I talked about flow load on the top right, which is simply a measure of how much work in progress, how much uncompleted work, partially completed work the teams have. I mentioned flow time, which is how long things took once we actually decided to work on it. And then flow efficiency, looking at your, your wait time. And I just wanna introduce this concept of what I call flow safety. Um, what I mentioned it to somebody this morning, they said, they said maybe another term for that might be net trust score or something. Um, but, um, you know, psychological, reducing psychological or improving psychological safety is one of the best things we can do in order to improve our metrics. Because if people are afraid to create work item types for the work they do, and then they have a lot of invisible work, or if there's work that's done under the table, then it doesn't show up in the metrics. Um, if they're fearful of, you know, if, if if they're fearful of leadership hearing bad news, <laughs> then it's going to be hard to get accurate metrics, right? It seems like leadership, the boss is always the last to know. So usually net promoter score, NPS scores have to do with, um, usually the question is, I would recommend uh, a friend of mine to work for this company. But here's some examples of other questions you can use. Um, like on my team, failure causes inquiry, not blame. Like, like do we have a highly blame culture? Um, is the boss open to hearing bad news, right? Do, are, is the messenger punished or not? You know, do people trust one another? So some good questions I got from Dr. Nicole Forsgren in a talk she gave uh, quite a while ago, but all still relevant today. takeaways for you because I'm aware of the time and I want to save time for questions. I'm almost done, Alex. Um, so just in order to give the teams kind of the freedom to do this DI work, this daily improvement work, so they can actually finish their work and get those good endorphins because they finished something, you know, we do get, have, there's a happiness factor that comes with being able to check or, or cross work off or moving that card to done, done uh, that we get. And so just bring visibility to those daily improvements. Try and run through those exercises to see if you can find a way to make them visible so you can manage them and actually use them as a work item type in your system. Try and enable this work in progress limits for DI work, for daily improvement work. And then experiment and observe and adapt. Uh, little by little, we've seen this be quite successful for our teams trying to get their heads um, above water. And so with that, um, if you send me an email at dominica at sendyourslides.com, I'll send you a bunch of stuff. This deck will come through IT Revolution, but I do have a lot of other presentations I've given and links to videos and stuff that you can get, um, as well as information. I need to add the new 
dependency matrix to this list, and I will do that. All right, time for questions. Okay, yeah, that's right. So, Dominica at sendyourslides.com, subject flow, to get all these wonderful things here. Questions. Yeah, yeah, before you, yeah, be sure you put flow in the subject, um, and also check your spam filter. This the email reply tends to get caught in people's spam filter. Okay, we've got uh, definitely some questions here, and then a really nice comment. I'll save that to the end. Oh, Maybe. nice. <laughs> First one, there's a, a bit to it, so I'll say it all, and then I'll let you, you can tell me to repeat any parts you need. Oh, so, good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dominica, I really like your book. How do you scale the visualization and make it possible to understand? The question ex is explained more below, so I'll do the next part if you'd like. First, I already have an step. answer to. Oh, you do? I do have an answer to that, but go ahead. Do you want to say uh, it? Okay, I'll I... tell. Okay, okay, I'll tell. Okay. So, so the examples that I showed could be used at any level, right? I mean, most of, most people look at those boards and they think, "Oh, that's at the team level," but you can do that at the executive level, right? I, I it's not unusual to see three levels of, vis of visibility on workflow. One at the team level, which is quite common, and that's what you know, JIRA is good for. And then um, you know, one at the, very, at the highest level. So you might be looking at your initiatives or maybe your epics at the very highest level. So you can have, um, at that level, the discussions are gonna be with leadership right? The prioritization on big initiatives uh, and seeing how long they're taking and that work will kind of move slower, right? And then, um, and then below that, you'll see visibility at the program level or the product value stream level, ideally, um, and then at the team level. So just get, so getting different views at different levels of work by being able to first have that work entered into some kind of tool where it can be tracked and it can be uh, flagged or tagged or have work item types for it that are you know, meaningful for that level in the organization. I hope that made sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Johan, I believe you asked the question, if there's more you'd like for um, Dominica on that, uh, just ping it on Slack and we'll get that over. The other part of the question here at the bottom, which I'm not sure if it was addressed yet, is how can this be visualized for two kinds of companies also? So DevOps, a large complex software product built by the IT department at Parts Unlimited, can also be Netflix, Spotify, and then industrial DevOps, a complex physical product like a Tesla where a car is the product. Whoa, that's a great question. Uh, I think I'm going to try and tackle that first part. Um, so, because, but let me preface it by saying that because it doesn't, I mean, the reason we're making work visible is so we can see where things are stuck, like where are things stuck. And it doesn't really get, do much good to optimize an area of the value stream that's not the bottleneck. So we want an end-to-end -end view, uh, even in a small organization, of the whole product value stream. You know, once because um, we want to show that you know, really the bottleneck is like the funding model. Like we only do this budgeting work once every twelve months, and we can't get our thing. We can't get funding for this thing that we want to do. Um, so. S, S, so I'm not, did that answer the first part of that? End to end product value stream, get visibility on, yep. on the whole product's value stream. And, and the product could be, the product could be a Tesla. Uh, the product could be, a, uh, have, you know, features that are being delivered to external customers. Or the product could be like an internal infrastructure platform that your internal teams are using. They're using that product. So there's different kinds of products, but it starts and ends with a customer who needs something from you, whether that's internal or external, whether it's a service or a car. Got and the most important questions. thing, 
Oh, just and the most important thing about that is that we're optimizing. Like if you're looking at cars, like BMW, they optimize for how they build the cars, not the car itself. The, itself. They're, they optimize for their plant. And the plant is optimized in such a way that the flow of how the building of the car moves through that product value stream is what they optimize for. That's a great answer. The, uh, you got a couple plus ones to funding challenges too when you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, next question. What's the most common objection you hear from C-level leaders against limiting WIP? Well, C-level leaders tend to get it. I have to say that it's usually the middle managers who are stuck in the middle who have the hardest time um, doing that because they're, they're just so pressured from both sides. Uh, I'm sure there are C-level leaders who say that everything must be done and we, we just, we're trying to blitz scale right now. <laughs> um, maybe I'd point them to the blitz scaling book. I mean, you cannot do, if, there, if you're triple booked, you cannot be in three places at one time. And so I might, give them this multitasking exercise I have and actually have them do it to see how, what the quality looks like and what the time looks like when they're attempting to multitask. Um, sorry, ask me again. How would, how would I, what, how would I? Most common objection you hear from C-level leaders oh, oh. against limiting WIP. Um, just we have, we have to get it done. And, and, and sometimes I'll hear, and I, this is horrible, like, well, we won't be any in business if we can't deliver this. We'll have to lay people off. <clears throat> um, we just don't, um, we just have to, to get it all done. And that's, that's, a, that's a red flag. some pressure. Okay. You ready for the next one? Yep. Okay. Got. What have been the most successful, what has been the most successful approach for addressing technical debt? Uh, I have seen both creating a hardening sprint iteration every now and then or mm -hmm. release or reserving velocity dedicated to this in each sprint iteration. Any other options, pros and cons? How do you ensure to change the mindset in addressing debt every day? Yeah, so I, I do see that where they set aside uh, one sprint to to address technical debt, and it's usually the last one, <laughs> and like it should be a little bit in every sprint, right? I mean, it's daily improvement. It's not just we'll do this the last sprint or you know the last week in it or the, the last day in it. All right, we need to break it down into smaller batch sizes so that we can do it at a daily level, daily pace. Um, there was a second part to that question, right? Or second. It was, um, how do you ensure to change the mindset in addressing debt every day? Changing mindset is... Um, well, when I think about changing mindset, I mean, that's, that's just hard. It's almost like you have to see an example first of a win of somebody else on another team doing it. And then people can see it, observe it, and then they get it. But for you to be the first one to try it in your organization is kind of scary and, and kind of hard. But I mean, you got to start somewhere. And one thing I think has helped is all the DevOps Enterprise Summit videos that are out there showing examples of other large organizations doing these kinds of changes. And it sort of helps the mind think, well, I mean, if they can do it, then maybe I can do it too, right? Giving some hope uh, for people to, um, to think that they can influence. You know, I have to say that 
So my background as a build engineer, spent a lot of time doing builds and automation and deployments. And people used to complain that builds took too long all the time. And I used to say, well, we, we have manual testing. And I used to rant about manual testing. And, but the ranting got me nowhere. It wasn't until I started capturing the metrics and presenting that data to leadership, it blew me away. I got budget, I got headcount, but probably more important, I got empathy for <laughs> what the teams were struggling with. The data just brought the credibility into the picture instead of me ranting about it. And I was able to present in a calm manner what the issue was. And that changed mindset, in my opinion. That's great. So we, I just want to be... Uh, respectful of your time. We are a couple minutes past the hour. If you have more time, there are more questions. How about weekend. one more question? And then maybe we can follow up with the rest in, in uh, the channel. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Do you have some recommendations on how to handle info work coming from different systems like emails, calendars, tasks, Slack threads, Jira tickets, the situation is similar at work or at home. A lot of things you want to do. I do, actually, because this is the nature of my work <laughs> that I do with TaskTop. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and so the first thing is, my opinion, is to, make, is to bring visibility to it. So we'll just do an exercise. So it's an exercise. So you bring your team or part or people who can speak for your on behalf of your team if it's too large. Bring the team upstream from you, bring the team downstream from you. And start, we call it a value stream canvas exercise. And we identify uh, how that those requests actually flow. And maybe they start in a you know, white hat security vulnerability or something, or, or maybe it starts in service now. And you just keep asking what happens as it, maybe it impacts development, but development's using Azure DevOps and, or TFS and Ops is using ServiceNow. Well, how do they communicate? Oh, and then you list Slack channel and you list email and you list spreadsheet or project status report. You actually draw symbols that, um, so people can see that thread of communication that's not linear, it's, you know, that weaves across through everybody that's impacted. And then if you can bring leadership <laughs> in the room and say, that, you know, take an incident, like a production incident that happened that actually impacted teams upstream and maybe it needed to get you know, maybe you needed to increase the bandwidth with your net network routers or something. And so you needed approvals for, from finance and that took forever. Or you needed to get a purchase order that took forever to get approval. And, and show what that looks like and show all the different work items that get created and all the different tools and how the communication occurs. Just put those little email symbols in there. Uh, and that I found has been extremely powerful. I've had, I've done that in a large finance organization, bring the VP, the VP is there um, of infrastructure observing this exercise and the jaw is dropped and the sponsorship came out of that to, um, to help improve their workflow and trying to reduce bottlenecks very powerful thing to do in my opinion great answer okay that was our last question for now i've All grabbed right. the remaining ones i just want to share the the one comment that came in there that was really nice uh, Monica, your book and youtube videos have changed my life my professional and personal life and in turn are positively changing the lives of my team members the info the cartoon doodle examples data points and suggested practices are so relatable and digestible Thank you so much for sharing uh -huh. your gifts and talents and helping us make work visible. Wow. Uh, Thank you so much. Made my, made my week. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, Dominica. Uh, All right. Interested. 
dominicaedsenderslides.com, subject flow. You can get all these amazing materials. We will share the slides. We will share this presentation recording. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Bye, everyone. See everybody. <laughs>